Mark chapter 14, Mark chapter 14, let me express my deep appreciation to the church for your uh, tangible uh, display of appreciation to your pastors. Uh, I will state the obvious for you here, not that you don't know, it's just so you'll know that I know. Uh, I am the interim preacher not the interim pastor. Uh, the fellows that you recognized here are the pastors. Uh, they have a vested interest and are planted here uh, and are growing with you and are leading you here. I'm just passing through. They're going to be here to see you through the next chapter that the Lord has for you to write in the history of this church. And so uh, what you have demonstrated is that you do properly appreciate your pastors and realize that you are blessed to have them. But let me say on their behalf, folks, I've been here long enough to be able to say this. They are equally blessed to have a congregation like you to be able to minister to. You know, we normally, when we say this, we mean something bad. Have you heard people say sometimes, well, you two people just deserve each other, you know? Uh, well, you can also say that in a positive way. The pastors here and this church congregation deserve each other. Uh, they deserve each other. Uh, wonderful people in a congregation and a great group of pastors to work with you and for you. Well, we have the privilege today uh, to worship, and you worship again in somewhat of a unique way as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so I'll take this opportunity maybe to do a little bit of uh, teaching concerning the Lord's Supper so that we have our attention on specifically what we're doing. We'll begin by reading Mark 14, beginning with verse 22. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Folks, the vast majority of Baptists, and other Protestants too, by the way, uh, have held that the New Testament teaches us that there are two ordinances that Jesus left for his church to celebrate perpetually. And of course, that is baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism symbolizes our entrance into the life of the church. And we just enter the life of the church one time when we're converted, and so we're just baptized one time. The Lord's Supper, on the other hand, symbolizes our spiritual growth, our maturity in Christ our growing in him, and our growing in fellowship with one another. And so it is done repeatedly. Now the Bible doesn't tell us how often it is to be done, but it is to be done more than just one time. This is something, as our church practices, that, uh, that we do from time to time because of what it symbolizes. Now folks, a very small minority of Christians throughout church history have maintained that there is another ordinance of the church, and that is foot washing. <clears throat> that this is to be an ordinance as, uh, as well. Uh, but the vast majority of Christians have rightly understood that foot washing is not an ordinance of the church that Jesus has given to the church for them to practice as a part of their worship. Now, several reasons are given for not seeing foot washing as an ordinance of the church. Uh, first of all, nothing is said about foot washing in any of the uh, epistles that we have in the
the New Testament, even those that are informing us of church life and what the nature of church life actually is. If, if this was an ordinance that God had, had expected the church as a congregation to practice, it, it is certain that this would be mentioned, at least mentioned, as a practice of the church somewhere in the epistles, and obviously it is not. Folks, foot washing was a practice in the ancient world at that time. It was, of just, a, a, it was just a display of kindness when particularly if someone came in, into your home. Uh, it was a matter of hospitality, but it was never something that people did publicly. It was not something that was um, sacramental, that was uh, involved in religion in some way. It wasn't any kind of a church observance. It's simply what people did for other people of acts as humility and kindness. And that's precisely when we have that example in John of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. That's precisely what he was doing. He was doing something that was done on such a regular basis that you remember the, at, at that time, it, it's when Jesus did that, the disciples were sort of looking around and saying, who's going to do this? Because that was an accepted practice in a private situation, there was nothing of a religious nature about it or whatever. A, a second reason that foot washing is not a, a, an ordinance of the church is it doesn't picture the gospel in any way. Uh, the gospel of a crucified, buried, and risen again Savior. The two ordinances that he gave to us actually are forms of preaching the gospel. They're actually telling us something about the message of the gospel. Of course, uh, baptism is a picture of our death, burial, and resurrection with the Lord Jesus Christ, who died and was resurrected, and we are united with him. That is a form of gospel proclamation. Folks, that's why a lot of churches, they like having baptisms outside of the church somewhere because it is a testimony to the people there of the gospel. If there are people that actually see it that aren't church people and they start asking, what are y'all doing? It's actually a form of preaching the gospel. The gospel can be shared when we tell them what the baptism actually is and what it means. And of course, the Lord's Supper as we're going to be able to participate in today, is a clear sign and symbol of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for us in his substitutionary death, substituting his life for our life. Both baptism and the Lord's Supper reflect the gospel message itself. Foot washing does not do that. The third thing I would point out is that in washing the disciples' feet, as Jesus did, folks, he was actually providing an actual service for them that they needed at that point, okay? Uh, when he instituted the Lord's Supper, folks, the people weren't hungry. The disciples weren't hungry, and so Jesus had the Lord's Supper and gave to them. They had just eaten, okay? Uh, he, did, he presented the Lord's Supper after they had eaten, it was a symbolic act of something else. It was indeed a symbol. The, 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 the supper itself is a symbol. When people were baptized, they weren't baptized because they were dirty and needed a bath. Okay? Uh, usually when they were going to be baptized, they had already had a bath. What was, it was symbolic of something else. When you look at foot washing, it was not it was not. Uh, 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 simply some kind of a symbol of something. He was actually performing a service for them and telling the disciples, y'all need to have that kind of attitude toward others. So it was not intended to be a symbolic act. They were actually supposed to go out and wash other people's feet as an act of humility, as we will see. The fourth thing that I would point out is that Jesus, the whole purpose of it was demonstrating humility. He was drawing a lesson on Christian living from it. Folks, in that culture, in that day, washing people's feet was a sign of humility. Remember, that's why the disciples, were, they were too proud at that opportunity to wash each other's feet. Okay? And that's exactly what Jesus was doing, was giving them a lesson in humility. 
Now, folks, in other societies, we don't, we don't do that in our society today as a common practice, okay? That doesn't mean we can't follow what Jesus was wanting us to do because what he was saying is you need to learn a lesson of humility, and he showed them that lesson in a way that was pertinent to their society. <laughs> you know, if Jesus were here today, and I would leave it to your imagination, and he wanted to teach us to be humble, I wonder what symbol he would use. I wonder what he would do. <laughs> we wouldn't want him to wash our feet. We don't wash each other's feet in our society. That's just not part of our culture. What Jesus was doing was part of his culture, and he used that to teach them a lesson. Now, what are we supposed to learn from what Jesus did there? Not to literally wash everybody else's feet. That's not part of our culture. But what he was teaching them is humility. That's what we were supposed to learn from Jesus washing the disciples' feet, to be humble toward one another. The vast, vast majority of believers through history have been exactly right, particularly Protestants here, okay? There are two ordinances that Jesus left for the church to practice on a perpetual basis. That is baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, Baptists have always tried to be careful, and I'm thankful for this, because there are some groups, and generally they're small as well, that teach that salvation comes by these ordinances, that you're saved particularly by being baptized. Or that the Lord's Supper adds to your salvation in some way. And Baptists have rightly opposed that and have not wanted to be associated with it. The problem is a lot of times we, instead of acting, we overreact. <laughs> and Baptists have a tendency, since we want to make sure that we don't think these actually have any kind of saving value, Baptists have tended to underemphasize the importance of these ordinances. We, we, we use um, such language as this, you know, well, you know, we, we have the Lord's Supper and, and we have baptism, but they're, they're merely, they're mere symbols. They're mere symbols. Well, if we say they are mere symbols, and they are, but we have to be careful when we say they are mere symbols, we may be seriously underestimating the value of symbols. Symbols are very powerful means of communication. And when we say they are symbolic, that doesn't in any way render them somehow insignificant, not important, and not of deep, deep spiritual value to us. A symbol can conjure up all kinds of images in our minds and emotions in our hearts. For instance, just Go to a Veterans Day parade and bring out an American flag and see what happens. Folks, the American flag really is a piece of cloth, but it actually symbolizes something, okay? And, and, and it, it's going to symbolize patriotism, uh, uh, pride in some way. Uh, it's going to symbolize personal sacrifice that is gone, and no wonder it's such parades when, when people bring out the flags, people generally bring out their handkerchiefs as well, well, you say, but those are mere symbols. Oh, yes, they're mere symbols. But symbols are very powerful means of communication. And so we as Baptists want to make sure that we do not underestimate the value of symbols. A person being immersed into water is a symbol. But, folks, it, it, it symbolizes something of great significance. When we take the Lord's Supper, Okay. It, it, it should make us uniquely aware of the presence of God in a way maybe that nothing else does. It depicts for us and calls to our mind many, many wonderful images and truths that can be a deep blessing to us if we understand what the Lord's Supper actually is symbolizing and what it does mean. So yes, we see it as a symbol, but symbols are very powerful means of communication. I want you to note, uh, by the way, you, you say you don't sound very Baptist to me. Uh, that may be because Baptists have changed a little bit too much over the years on this and are failing to appreciate this as we should. Let me read to you a very short excerpt from the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. May not be very important to you, 
uh, Southern Baptist historian Leon Macbeth said outside of the Bible, that document has been the most influential document in the history of Baptists in America. Okay? So this is not some little thing tucked away somewhere that has no meaning, no historical value, or no historical val or no value for us today. This is what he says it says about the ordinances. Okay? This is Baptist speaking here. And they're being very Baptist in what they're saying here. Faith is wrought by the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit uses such things as the ordinances to strengthen faith. Folks, when you partake of the Lord's Supper, are you asking him to strengthen your faith as we participate in what this symbolizes? It goes on to say, the gift of faith whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts. It is, here's, how, how does that faith work in their hearts? How does it come about? They tell us. It is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the word. That's through preaching. Is preaching supposed to convey grace to you in some way? I certainly hope so. It happens through the preaching of the word by also the administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper and prayer and other means appointed by God to in, in, increase and strengthen our faith. Our Baptist forefathers understood this as a means of grace along the lines of preaching, okay, praying, fellowship with one another. Okay? <laughs> These are means of grace. And we need to understand them as that. And so when we say they are symbols, even if we do say mere symbols, that we understand that God conveys grace to his people through the Lord's Supper that we have the opportunity to participate in. Now, Christians through the years have held various views concerning of in what way is Christ actually present in the Lord's Supper. Um, most of you are probably aware that the Roman Catholic Church has a very unique position on that. Uh, since the year A.D. 1215, at one of the uh, church councils, 12, A.D. 1215, their official position has been called transubstantiation. Transubstantiation sounds very, you know, uh, uh, like it's somewhat el elaborate, enigmatic. It, it, what it means, trans means change, substance. They're, they're saying that when the, pr the priest announces this is my body, that the substance actually changes into the body of Christ or the blood of Christ. Now, those of us who don't understand what they're saying say, well, can't they just look at it and see it looks the same? <laughs> you know, they say, yes, we actually can look and see. We didn't say that the attributes were changing, the substance is changing. Substance is not the same thing as the attributes. If I'm holding a round ball and it's red, it has attributes. Round and red and maybe smooth. Okay? Well, what is it that's round or red and smooth? Well, it's this substance that's holding those attributes. You don't see him, you just see the attributes themselves. Okay? Their claim is not that the attributes change, but the substance that holds those attributes change, and so it doesn't look any different. Okay? So at least to understand what our Catholic friends are saying to us, they understand. Now, in some sense, in some sense, that is seen as being a reenaction of the crucifixion. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, we always want to be very fair in, in saying they are certainly not claiming that Jesus needs to be crucified again for their sins. However, they take that and understand it. They are not saying that Jesus is having to die again on the cross for everybody's sins. Okay? But there are problems with this view. One is it just takes the statement of Jesus literally instead of how it was meant to take. I mean, it is true. We just read the passage. Jesus said, this is my body. And they're saying, that's exactly what we believe. It is his body. Jesus said, this is my blood. They're saying, this is his blood. It must literally be changing into his blood. Folks, it's very clear 
that Jesus is using, again, symbolic language here, not literally. Jesus also said, I'm the door, you know, but he didn't have a doorknob on him, okay? What did he mean? He certainly meant something by saying he's a door, but that wasn't, that wasn't literal. He, he said, I'm the true vine, and you're the branches, but we don't have leaves growing off of us, okay? Um, God said, um, I am a rock, you know, but you can't pick him up and put him in your pocket. He certainly means something very important by telling us that he's a rock, okay? It's just not to be taken literally here. And of course, an additional problem here is however the Catholic Church uh, uh, explains that, it is still in some way representing the death of Jesus again not in as being something found. The book of Hebrews makes it very clear. Jesus offered one sacrifice for one time, and it was sufficient, and so he sat down. He's finished making the offering and the sacrifice. Now, when the time of the Protestant Reformation came, Martin Luther, who didn't completely shed his Catholic influence, held somewhat of a similar position. He did not hold to transubstantiation. He held to what is called consubstantiation. Same word substance, but the word con means with. He did not believe that that substance literally changed into the, the body and blood of Christ. What he believed is that somehow it took on those attributes as well. In other words, probably the best way to explain it visually would be like a sponge. You know, you can squeeze a sponge and you can hold it down in water and you can let it go and what happens? It takes on water. It's still the same sponge, okay? It, it didn't add any attribute, it just took a... That seems to be more what Luther was saying, that in the Lord's Supper, it doesn't change, but Jesus' spirit in some way, in fact, even his body, wish I had time to go into that, <laughs> His body is actually somewhat absorbed into that supper, and you are actually, again, partaking of the body and blood of Christ. Now, one theologian, a historian, said the best thing to describe Luther's position, it's not this is my body, but this accompanies my body, <laughs> okay? or my body accompanies this. These things are put together somehow. Now, other Protestants, many of them, said that Christ is in the Lord's Supper, but spiritually, not in any way physically. He is uniquely somehow in that, those elements when we partake of them, spiritually, not in any way physically. Now, there's still other Protestants who have said, look, Christ is not really uniquely in these elements in, in any way. Uh, you are simply remembering the death of Christ and everything that it entails, everything that it includes. The Lord's Supper is just exhausted by the phrase, do this in remembrance of me. There is no special presence of Jesus in any of them. But I do again want to point out the 1689 Confession of Faith says that the Lord's Supper is a means of grace. Your Baptist forefathers. It didn't say it would save you. It says it is a means of conveying grace, just like the preaching of the Word of God is, just like prayer is, just like fellowship with believers. It is a means of grace. The Baptist Faith and Message, which is our Baptist, it speaks of the Lord's Supper as both a memorial, okay? It's the memorial comes from the word memory. That means it's looking backward, okay? We are remembering something, we are memorializing, but it also looks to the future, as the text does, and anticipates. It looks backward, it looks backward at the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But folks, it also is a means of grace to us because it renews in our minds the promise that Jesus gave us that he's not going to partake of this until he does it with us in his kingdom. It is a proclamation as we partake of the Lord's Supper. It is a proclamation of the coming of Jesus and of his kingdom of which we are going to be a part. So 
What does the Lord's Supper mean to us as we look at it? When we think about these symbols, what does it symbolize for us that ought to be on the forefronts of our minds? Well, obviously, it, it symbolizes the death of Christ, uh, the death of Jesus himself. The, the, the bread symbolizes his broken body that was broken for us. It, it's a visual uh, portrait for us of what Jesus did for us. Of course, the cup is the, represents the poured out blood. That's why Jesus said, I mean, Paul said in referring to this in 1 Corinthians 11, when you partake of the Lord's Supper, notice you're actually doing something else as well. He says you're proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes. Folks, when we have the Lord's Supper, all of you get to be the preacher for that time. All of you are going to be proclaiming something. We're proclaiming to one another our firm conviction that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses us of all of our sins. It is a proclamation. We are actually proclaiming something when we do this. The Bible says, not just a mere symbol, but that symbol. By that symbol, we're proclaiming our belief in his death. Folks, it's also a form of spiritual nourishment. Just as um, um, uh, our physical food nourishes us physically, our spiritual food actually nourishes us spiritually. We're supposed to get spiritual nourishment from partaking of the Lord's Supper. It's a means of grace. In John 6, beginning with 53, verse 3, Jesus said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink my blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at that last day. For my flesh is food. Okay? Just like a steak that you eat is food and it nourishes your body. He says, my flesh is indeed food. My blood is drink indeed. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Obviously, Jesus is not speaking here literally of his flesh. None of us would be around to be able to eat of it anyway. He's certainly not talking uh, literally here. Just because somebody says something in a way that's not literal doesn't mean that it's meaningless, okay? It is still very powerful. Through the Lord's Supper, we are to be nourished spiritually by partaking of it. It also means something else. It signifies the unity of believers, that we are actually one. And again, in 1 Corinthians, Paul uses the Lord's Supper to stress the unity of the church. He said, because there's one bread, we who are many are one body because we all partake of one bread. Folks, when we, when we participate in the Lord's Supper, it is a testimony of our unity in Christ, that we are one in Christ, that we have all recognized that we have the same need and that is that we're sinners, and that we have the same hope, and that is in what Christ has done for us, okay? And we are unified as a group of common believers in Christ. When we participate in the Lord's Supper, we are testifying through the proclamation of the Word that we are one in Christ. So it's important that we act like we're one in Christ the unity of true believers. It's also a way of affirming our faith in Christ. Okay? It's testifying that we need his blood. We need that broken body. And as I've hinted at, it is also a statement that we are proclaiming to each other and to the world that we're anticipating that even though we live in a dark day, things are going to get better. <laughs> There's a kingdom coming. And Jesus' blood that was shed, his body that was broken, guarantees that for us. It reminds us of what Jesus did, and it reminds us of what he's going to do. He is going to come again for us to have perfect fellowship together. Now, that's the Lord's Supper. Who are the proper participants? Who is supposed to participate in the Lord's Supper. Well, the Bible actually gives us 
uh, what we would say is, is two uh, um, truths that ought to be true of us, and that is it is for believers. It is for believers. Folks, if, if it means the very things that I just pointed out, it ought to be very clear it is for believers only. It is not what you may or may not have heard some people refer to as a converting ordinance. It is an ordinance also like the Word of God. When it's preached, it's supposed to convert people. That the purpose of the Lord's Supper is also to convert people. And so the argument is, wrongly, that people who are not saved should be able to participate in the Lord's Supper because it is a means by which they are to be converted. I would just say, don't confuse that with the biblical view. That is not the biblical view of the Lord's Supper. In fact, Paul makes that clear with this second uh, item here. Not only that be believers, but that we examine ourselves in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, beginning with 27. Whomever therefore eats of the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Folks, would we want to invite unsaved people to profane the body and the blood of Jesus? <laughs> That's what we would be doing if we invite them even with the good purpose of wanting to see them saved, that we would have them to participate in the Lord's Supper. It says they are then profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats or drinks without discerning the body and drinks, then drinks judgment upon himself. Okay? The Bible is very clear. This is a church ordinance. It is an ordinance for believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and believers who are not harboring sin and iniquity in their hearts while they are partaking of the Lord's Supper. That tells us that it is also a time of confession of sin, that we do ask God to do what the psalmist asked him to do. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Show me if there is any wicked way in me. Why? So that we can repent of that, that we can turn from it and plead the very blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that our supper symbolizes here. We'll go to the Lord's table. Um, our deacons are going to join me here uh, as